Please be seated for our next contest. You might have noticed I found the adjustment on the mic. Yeah. There we go. Yeah. I can change light bulbs without needing a chair sometimes. Okay. We will now conduct our humor speech contest. Now within our short break of five minutes, within that time, if you had time to take your bio break and get some food and use your phone, please turn your phone off again so it does not disrupt our, our contestants during this contest. Once the contest has begun, the Sergeant at Arms will secure the doors. Members of the audience are asked to refrain from leaving or entering the room during the contest. After the contest, please do not leave the room until it's determined that all ballots have been collected. And we already did the cell phone thing. All right, we're going to do the order for the contest. Contestant number one, Barbara Holt. Barbara Holt will be contestant number one. Contestant number two will be Jerry Lowers. Jerry Lowers will be contestant number two. Contestant number three is Ruth King. Ruth King will be contestant number three. Contestant number four will be Stan Rolker. Stan Rolker will be contestant number four. Contestant number five will be Joanne Telser Frere. Joanne Telser Frere will be contestant number five. Contestant number six will be Francesca Pepiat. Francesca Pepiat will be contestant number six. There will be one minute of silence before the first contestant. Timers. That was expediently one minute. Please reset the timer. <laughs> we will now begin the humorous speech contest. <laughs> Barbara Holt, a baddie night. A baddie night, Barbara Holt. with my sister in Grand Rapids, Michigan. The plan was, I was going to, because we extended our day so long, I was going to stay the night on the sofa and quietly slip out of the house in the early morning to make my drive back to Illinois. While I was sleeping, the cat started crying. The cat's name is Kingsley. He started crying. Usually when Kingsley cries, I call to him softly. He will jump on my belly, climb up to my chest, lay there, and I'll soothe him and pet him and we'll both go to sleep. Kingsley loves it when I stay the night. This night, suddenly, I hear Kingsley cry. And he cries softly, a little unusual. I don't think anything about it and I call out to him. He replies not with his gentle pounce on me. He has a whine to his cry like 
he has caught a mouse and nothing will play with him. While I'm trying to come awake, I feel this swoosh of air. No sound, just a swoosh of air. My heart starts to pound. My breathing starts getting rapid. I'm trying to wake up. When I am fully awake, I see a bat swooshing all over the room. He's in circles. I'm terrified. What am I going to do? Is it a bat? Why is it a bat? My first instinct is I'm leaving. <laughs> Let the homeowner deal with it. The problem with that thought is it's my favorite sister, and I can't leave her to take care of the bat. So I frantically start thinking, what am I going to do? I get this idea. I'm going to take a towel and snap him to get him out the front door. So I go and I open up the front door, go and get a towel, and I snap him. And I'm snapping at him as he's flying around. He decides to stick to the door jam. So I hit him again with the towel. This does nothing but make Mr. Bat mad. And he does this to me. <laughs> I never saw a bat so big with his wings folded. Normally, I'm used to seeing like a mouse type bat. This bat looked like a small kitten. So fear is now taking over. I don't know why because I can't, I've never been a ball player, but I decide that to battle this bat, I'm going to get a broom. So I go to the side and I grab my broom and I'm going to get this broom and I'm going to smack this bat. So I start swooshing at him. My sister has a low ceiling so I can't go real high. So I'm swooshing at this bat and he's flying around. Now, he, I, his eyes are bugging, and he's glaring at me. So I get afraid, and I do this. Ah! <laughs> Don't ever shriek at a bat. Bats do not like to be shrieked at. So while I'm crouching and the cat's jumping and crying, this bat is going crazy. Finally, I connect him. Whack! He hits the wall, and down he falls behind the TV. So I have to creep over there, get on my strength. I get over there, and there's Mr. Bat looking at me. <laughs> so I go to swoosh him out the door. He takes flight again. Now, I've smacked him a second time into the other door jam, where he proceeds to climb backwards under the door. I didn't know that bats could flatten themselves like a mouse, but they can. So I open up the bedroom door, because that's the, my nephew's room. I get him back into the dining room, into the living room, and he is swooshing around. Really. Now, my sister at this point is awake. So much for leaving quietly. She comes to the door and she says, what is all this racket? I say, there's a bat in the house and I can't get it out. She slams the kitchen door and says, you deal with it. And she goes back to bed. <laughs> so here I am battling this bat. Finally, I decide he's big like a, like a small kitten. I can take the broom, which is not small, smack him right out the doorway. Missed. Finally, I smack him into that wall. He falls down. And I have to get up the courage because now this is where all the shoes are kept. I creep over there ever so softly and there he is staring at me again. So I decide I'm going to sweep him out the door. So I throw down the broom and I get a rake. <laughs> and I get the rake and he starts climbing through the times. Finally, I get him out the door and I shut the door. By this time, I'm exhausted. So I decide to lay down and just relax. When suddenly, I'm laying there and I feel something on me. And I look. And I open my eyes and it's the bat. Oh. And 
he's crawling higher and higher and higher, and he's about here, and I don't know what I'm going to do, and I woke up. May we have one minute of silence, please? Jerry Lowers, going for the white chocolate. Going for the white chocolate, Jerry Lowers. Fellow Toastmasters, yes. I know we probably all saw some of the Olympics, lots of venues to watch on TV, and of course, for many of us, especially those of us who are age and weight challenged, that's probably about all we can ever hope for, for an Olympics. Realistically, we wish that tanning was an Olympic sport. At least then we'd have a chance at bronze. <laughs> Let's face it, there's Gen Ys, Gen X's, Gen Z's, and then there's Gen O's, old and overweight, like me. But what if there was a Gen O Olympics? Let's see what that might entail. Key would be who would qualify for the Gen O Olympics. That's simple. Qualifying would be based on age and BMI which stands for Big Mac Indicator. <laughs> if your BMI is 25 or over, the bad news is you're overweight. The good news is you qualify for the Gen OO Olympics. Let's look at some of the events. Freestyle wrestling is a popular regular Olympic event that would be retained but modified. First, Current Olympic rules require stretch material in either red or blue for wrestling uniforms, and that would have to change. Stretch material would be so totally unflattering for Gen O's who wear what I call the Roman sizes. You know, L, XL, XXL, XXXL, and DC, which means Dunn County. <laughs> Second, there would be no restrictions on colors. However, the organizers urge participants to stay away from bright colors and horizontal stripes, which tend to make the wearer look wider. Also, the television cameras exacerbate that problem because they make people look bigger than they appear. Remember, the objective is to win events, not fill up the wide screen. <laughs> Sailboat racing is another popular Olympic event. However, many Gen OOs feel that sailboating is the art of getting wet and becoming ill while slowly going nowhere at great expense. Accordingly, 
Gen OO Olympic boat racing would be between equally matched luxury cruise liners. <laughs> Let someone else do the sailing. Well, Gen OOs do what they do best, relax and enjoy good food and drink. Sadly, another popular regular Olympic uh, water sport swimming would not be held. That's because of the risk of drowning. Because for many Gen OOs, it's never been more than a half an hour since they last ate. <laughs> Other Olympic sports, such as sprinting and basketball, would be retained but modified. In the regular Olympics, sprint winners are determined by the first torso, excluding limbs, neck, head, to cross the finish line. However, in recognition of their generous BMIs, Gen OO Olympic winners would be, Sprint Olympic winners would be those stomachs that first crossed the finish line. <laughs> the regular basketball events would be replaced by trash can basketball. This is to take advantage of the many years of hard training that Gen OOs have put in by throwing wadded paper balls into their waste baskets at their offices. <laughs> also, because Gen OOs endurance levels are at the low end of the range, the water polo and regular polo events would be combined. The organizers urge participants to make sure that their horses are good swimmers. <laughs> <laughs> Lastly, there would be no hurdles events. That's because the organizers feel that Gen OOs have already faced enough hurdles in their lives. <laughs> As one Gen OO said, at my age, if I can't eat it or drink it, I don't want it. <laughs> With this in mind, Gen OO Olympic winners would not be awarded the traditional medals. They would be awarded medals made out of chocolate, which Gen OOs enthusiastically eat for the health benefits. In fact, some Gen OOs feel that a balanced meal is a piece of chocolate in each hand. <laughs> White chocolate would be awarded for first, dark chocolate for second, milk chocolate for third. The organizers urge winners to refrain from wolfing down their medals <laughs> during the award ceremonies. With this in mind, the Latin motto for the Gen OO Olympics would be changed to Ingresius in Album Celestoe, which means Going for the white chocolate! And of course, the new Gen OO Olympic flag would not have five rings, just two, in celebration of the old generation!
Ruth King, Jesse James, Killing Me Softly. Jesse James, Killing Me Softly, Ruth King. Good afternoon, fellow Toastmaster. I'd like to know how many of you out there are parents. Yes, that's what I thought. So I'm a parent too. I have two daughters and one son. My son is a special needs child, so it takes a little more understanding, a little bit more, uh, just at ease with him. But he is a challenge and he is an adventure and he kills me softly each and every time. I saved up to buy my son special boots. I said, he deserves boots like the other kids. So I got him a little special boots, saved up for him, put him on his little feet, took him down to the bus, put him on the bus. I had my robe on because I just came in from work. And he's on the bus, and I'm waving bye to him, and all of a sudden I see, and I'm like, what is that? Can't, no, can't, wait. The bus is going, wait, wait. His shoe, how did his shoe get off the bus? And then I see again, the other shoe is gone. <laughs> I'm like, oh man, I'm on the, the street, running down Vincent Boulevard, running after this yellow bus with two shoes in my hand, going, stop, stop. Finally, the bus driver sees me in the light and he stops and he lets me on the bus. And just as I'm getting on the bus, I see my son with his pants in his head, getting ready to drop them off too. <laughs> like I said, my child kills me softly, just a little bit each time. That's all right. He gives me venture. He also doesn't let me sleep. So after I say I work 12 hours a night, I come in, I'm a little tired. I get in bed and I put him in bed with me. So I usually fist his little jeans on him, put him close to me, so I know exactly where he is. One morning I heard all this shouting. I pulled the jeans, and sure enough, they're empty. <laughs> where is he? So I'm trying to wake up, and I'm shaking and trying to get my eyes open, and finally I see a little silicus behind the drapes. Oh my God, he's on the ledge walking. So I don't want to call his name, I just want to try and get him really quick before he falls out the window. So I grabs him and I hold him and I'm like, thank you. Then all of a sudden I hear, and I look down and their whole street is lined with people looking up at me. I realized then, I got out of bed and then put on a robe. <laughs> so now I'm trying to cover him and run back. Like I said, my son is so adventurous. I decided that mm, he should have a reward every time he does something good. His teacher suggested I give him raisins. A couple box of raisins in the refrigerator. And one goes to sleep again with him. This time I'm thinking, I won't sleep too hard because I know he's going to get up. But sure enough, those 12 hours knocked me down and I was out of it. Woke up and I can't see. I can't hear anything but fuzziness. I wonder, am I dying? Did I have a heart attack? Who's going to take care of my son for me? And I can hear him in the background just laughing. And I'm thinking, oh, He's laughing at TV. All of a sudden, I, <coughs> I call, <coughs> call for, <coughs> what, <coughs> raisins. He has filled every hole with raisins. <laughs> I had raisins in my eyes, raisins in my ear, stuffed my mouth, raisins in my hair. It took two weeks to get all the raisins out. I was still shaking raisins out two weeks later. But it's all right because, like you parents out there, I love my child 
most definitely, even when he's killing me softly. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Stan Wilkin, the ump is blind. The ump is blind, Stan Wilkin. Madam Toastmaster, fellow Toastmasters and honored guests, I love watching baseball. I've been watching it for more than 60 years. started watching it in 1948 when it was a black and white little TV. I didn't know the grass wasn't gray until my aunt finally took me to a ball game. <laughs> and when she took me to a ball game, I got to see the beautiful green, green grass of Yankee Stadium. And now, I bleed pinstripes every time the Yankees lose. Speaking of losing, I like to meet my Cub friends during spring training and ask them if the Cubs are mathematically eliminated yet. <laughs> now, ball players aren't the only colorful actors on the field. The young players. You need to look at the umpires. They are very colorful, too. Now, over the years, I've classified the different types of movements that the umpires have done. And I've put them into four different categories. One is the pointers. And we have the pointers that go right and the pointers that go left. Two, we have what I call the muscle men umpires. Three, we have what I call the contact searchers. And four, the last unique group, that is what I call, could call it the hip hop umpires. Now let's do the, the first group. The first group of umpires on the pointing to the right. And they're behind the plate, and a strike comes in, strike! And they're looking, they're, they're not really watching the ball game, they're looking for a cute little lady up in the stands. <laughs> strike two! I thought I saw her, she was, where is she now? Okay, those are the right pointers. Now left pointers, they're more biased towards the home team. So when they're behind the plate, Strike! They go this way. That's usually where the visiting team is. What they're trying to tell the batter is, you don't belong here. Go back to your, your dugout. Strike two! Get back there. You can't hit this guy. That's what they're doing. Now, the other pointers, the other second category of the umpires, I call the muscle men. And you've seen that where they have the, the the hand signal like this. Oh, let me remind you that 
back in 1900, the umpires developed these hand signals so they could help a deaf ball player, a Fred Hoy, I believe his name was. So this, this group of umpires, when they have a strike, strike! You remember those phone books? This guy is like tearing a phone book. He is, he looks so mean. The other type of umpire, well, he's trying to do something else. Strike! He's pulling that bell down. It's gonna come down from that chapel. Now, not all of the action of umpires is behind the plate. We have the umpires out in the field. And we have what I call the contact searcher. Now picture this in the mind. The catcher's there waiting for the ball to come. The plate's right there. The run is coming around and he starts to slide, trying to avoid the tag. And here's the umpire. He's on the floor looking like this. Just checking and as he slides in, he put, you're out. So he's just looking around there. So those, that's the contact type. And finally, we have what I call the hip hop or dance step. Again, picture this in your mind. Small television screen. You see the second baseman waiting for the throw from the catcher. And you see the runner coming in. The umpire is nowhere in sight. And all of a sudden, here comes, and this is my favorite umpire, Ron Luciano, who used to umpire in the 60s. And he comes, <laughs> you're out, you're out, you're out. <laughs> I was really worried I wasn't going to be able to do that. <laughs> but he, he took everything away. So those are the umpires, and you should take a look at them during a ball game. But let me remind you, when you hear the crowd saying, the ump's blind, just remember they developed these signs to help a deaf ball player. <laughs> Madam Toastmaster. Timers, may we have one minute. Joanne Telter Froon, French Lessons. French Lessons, Joanne Telter Froon. When I was in sixth grade, Mademoiselle Suzette came into my classroom and changed my life forever. She was there to teach us French. She said, bonjour and I was hooked. I was going to live in France and be French. From that moment, my life revolved around everything French. The film, An American in Paris. The book, Madeleine. And those wonderful French lovers, Maurice Chevalier and Pigby Le Pew. <laughs> <laughs> I loved everything French. French fries, French quiche, French toast, French wine, French men, and oh la la, French kiss. 
20 years later, I was ready to move to France, and not as an American tourist. Oh no, I was determined to out French the French. <laughs> so I called my mother's friend Claudette. She's French, of course, with a name like that. Claudette, guess what? I'm finally moving to France. I'm so excited, but I need your advice. What should I wear so I don't look American? Oh, my chérie, but don't worry about your clothes. Everybody wears jeans and t-shirts. Wear a jean and a t-shirt. You will be fine. So, I set off for Paris, wearing my jeans and t-shirt, and thinking that I looked enchanting, chic, and elegant. I was wrong. <laughs> oh, and by the way, I didn't wear deodorant. Everyone knows the French don't wear deodorant. So by the time I arrived in Paris, I thought I looked and smelled perfectly French. I jumped into a taxi, and in my best French, I said, Hotel Saint Pierre, s'il vous plaît. Ah, oh, you are an American tourist. <laughs> then I realized I didn't have a beret. So I asked the taxi driver to stop so I could buy one. Can you believe he took me to a souvenir shop? <laughs> but they did have berets, and I even bought a little scarf because I thought that might make me more French. So I walked into my hotel, <laughs> and there was a really hot Frenchman at the desk. Yeah. Hello, mademoiselle. I hope you will have a very nice time in Paris. First of all, he spoke English to me. Second of all, he checked me in but he didn't check me out. <laughs> and to make matters worse, when I was going up to my room, I heard him say, did you see that American tourist so ridiculous? <laughs> and that smell! Oh, you there! Mon Dieu! I thought I would die. <laughs> French lesson number one. Where deodorant, <laughs> as if I didn't know that. I went up to my room, put up deodorant, and looked at my bag in despair. Why had I asked Claudette for advice? She's 85 years old, <laughs> and she hasn't been to France since De Gaulle. <laughs> what was I thinking? But it was Saturday night. And I was going to go out on the town and meet some handsome French guys. I was going to discover Parisian nightlife. I was going to be une femme fatale. <laughs> so when I got to the nightclub, I looked around, and I saw everybody doing that kissing thing. Sashayed up to a pretty hot guy. Bonjour, je m'appelle Joanne. Et toi, Jean-Pierre. So I threw my arms around him and gave him some of those French kisses. He pushed me away. Why are you kissing me? I don't even know you. French lesson number two. Don't kiss strangers, <laughs> as if I didn't know that. But I didn't give up. I saw another guy down there at the bar. Bonjour, je m'appelle Joanne, et toi, Maurice. Enchanté. Enchanté. Now this was going better. We chatted in French and drank French wine, and chatted in French and drank French wine, 
and chatted in French and drank French wine, and my French got better with the wine. <laughs> then I blew it. He asked me if I was hungry. No merci, je suis plein. I thought I was telling him I was full, but he fell off his stool laughing. <laughs> French lesson number three. Don't say, I am a pregnant cow, <laughs> when you want to tell someone you're full. <laughs> but I didn't give up. Oh, no. I stayed in France. I started learning about the real French. The French who sit in cafes and argue about everything from politics to the right wine. Little by little, I became the French woman I always wanted to be. I learned the language. <laughs> I learned how to cook. And I even developed the French attitude. Oh, if only my teacher, Madame Suzette, could see me today. Madame the Toastmaster. <laughs> Francesca Pepia, the thrill of victory and the agony of defeat. The thrill of victory and the agony of defeat. Francesca Pepia. As I stand here, I would think that maybe the last thing you would imagine about me is, um, I bet she did a marathon. Am I right? <laughs> Madam Toastmaster, fellow Toastmasters, dignitaries, and honored guests, every Olympic year I always get that urge, maybe I could stand on the podium and have a medal draped around my neck. It's not going to happen. <laughs> but, you know, especially this is important because this is the weekend of the Chicago Marathon. And my marathon journey began when I discovered the Leukemia Society's team and training. Now they allow you to train for free, I get to help people, probably lose weight, and I have the bragging rights of saying, I did a marathon. The first part of that journey is you get to meet your patient hero. Now my little patient hero, her name was Megan, and she was a sweet, bright-faced little girl, and her parents told me about the horrifying treatments that she had to take, and I thought she was so incredibly brave. I said, Megan, you're the most brave person I know in the world. And she looked up at me and said, oh no, really? You're really the brave one. When you think about it, you're going 26.2 miles in a marathon just for me? Um, you're so brave, a fat lady like you doing that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, my training starts. It's 6 o'clock in the morning. Did I mention that it was January and it's a blizzard? <laughs> the ice is caking on my face and my wet, icy feet slogging along. 
But lucky for me, the wind was howling so loud that nobody could hear me scream. <laughs> Why are you doing this? You're a fluffy woman with no muscles. Why are you doing a marathon? But I kept going. My, week after week, I was put into my special group with the slow walkers. <laughs> it was me, Mary, and Katrina. And we all walked together every Saturday. We would go out, we would be in a team, walking together, coming in, dead last, but together. It was wonderful. So imagine the months go by, the training continues, and the day approaches. It's the day before, the night we're having a fabulous banquet. All the team and training people are coming back from all over the country to join us for a lovely carb-loading dinner. But lucky for me, my carbs were fully loaded. <laughs> So we were there, we got our numbers for our shirts, we got our special computer chip to go in our shoes so we can tell exactly when we finished. We also got the big news that we were gonna get a one hour head start. Hey! <laughs> so, the day starts. It's 5.30 in the morning, the sun is just coming up, glinting on the buildings and the skyline. On your mark, get set. Walk, okay, we're just walking. We're getting a nice pace going. We have good training that's happening. And then it happens. The Kenyans are coming with their long, purposeful, powerful strides, not breaking a sweat, not even breathing heavily, going right past the footsteps, echoing through the canyons of the city. Then the thundering herd of the rest of the runners coming all over us like a massive tornado of humanity, jockeying for position. I mean, we're just barely started and I'm already going behind. It's like chariots of fire in reverse. Na 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 I lost Mary and Katrina in an hour. I'm by myself pretty much on, the, on this tr uh, track. Then suddenly, luckily, this woman finds me to get me back on path. She gets me back on path, and then the 70-year-old woman leaves me in her dust. <laughs> <laughs> hour after agonizing hour. I mean, I don't do fun things for this length of time. I finally see this couple walking down the street, and the man looks at me, and he sees the number on my shirt, and he says, hey, how was that marathon? I said, I'm still doing it. <laughs> He like waves and goes, oh my gosh, she's still doing it, can you believe it? So my feet feel like Frankenstein monster feet, just clunking ahead. I see up ahead of me, 20 mile marker, oh, I'm almost there. Suddenly the team in training, coaches come up and walk beside me, all perky and everything like that. Hi, how are you? You're doing great, oh, you're doing fabulous. But you gotta go faster. Faster? I can barely do what I'm doing right now. So they said, we can help you. How can you help me? What, are you going to carry me? What's going to happen here? He said, no, we can drive you like the five miles or so. I said, look, I'm doing this for a little girl. I'm doing this for myself. I can't have you drive me and saying, like, yeah, I did a marathon except for five miles. So I said, I've done all this. Why can't you? They snapped into action in no time. They were on the walkie talkie. Okay, she's on her way. Hold that, hold that finish line open. Then the other one started pacing in front of me, and I was walking to keep up with him faster and faster, as much as I could go with my Frankenstein feet going on, clomping along. People, drunk people, all the way along on the, the verandas. Way to get it all, way to go! I don't know that they knew what I was going for, but I was very happy for the confidence builder. So I'm going, clomping along. Finally, point six. All the team and training people who had been back, showered, dressed, and changed for hours, they come out to cheer me on. It was so exciting. Then the announcer says, and now, coming in, dead last, from Chicago, Illinois, it's Francesca Pepe. Ah! Na, 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 na. I mean, nine and a half hours. The Kenyans are back in Africa by now. There I stand. They pulled out that medal. This was not the Olympics, but the thrill of victory surpassed the agony of defeat that day, and these feet. When they put that around my neck, I realized I did this for Megan, I did this for myself, but I did it, and it was worth it. <laughs> Everyone, please.
please remain silent for the judges to complete their ballots and all the ballots have been collected by the ballot counters. Madam Toastmaster, the ballots have been collected. While the ballots are being counted, we will meet our contestants. May I please have the speech evaluation contestants right up front, please. our contestants. Our first contestant was Anisha Perkins. So Anisha, what club are you representing? The Figures of Speech in Lake Forest with Granger. All right. And what accreditation level have you achieved thus far? I uh, just completed my fifth speech towards my uh, <coughs> All right, congratulations. And uh, one of the items that you've listed is reading. I'm an avid reader as well. I'm always looking for tips. What is the current book that you're reading now, or do you have a, a recent favorite that you've read? And tell us a little bit about it. Uh, one of my favorite books that I'm reading right now is Seven Habits of Highly Effective People by Stephen Covey. And uh, it's a really good book. Uh, it, it puts you to action. So you're not just reading, but you're actually taking it and moving forward uh, with it. It's one of my favorites. So always learning something, just like Toastmasters, right? Yes. All right. Well, congratulations. I have a certificate for you. Our next contestant is Pan Angero. Pan, what club are you representing tonight? 
I'm representing the you need to Toastmasters. All right, and how long have you been Toastmasters? I've been in Toastmasters for about a year now. All right, and the, any accreditation that you've received so far? So far, I've completed the sixth speech in the CC manual. All right, congratulations. <laughs> uh, one of the items that you've listed is about speaking engagements to nonprofit organizations. What type of nonprofit organizations um, do you speak to, and what do you speak about? Most of the time, I would speak to uh, cause based nonprofits and also associations. And I actually speak to them about, about storytelling. So that's why I'm here at Toastmasters to polish up my skills in storytelling. So it all ties together. It all ties together. All right. Thank you, Pat. I'm going to take a you. Hi, Ria. Hi. How's it going? How do you think it's going so far? Representing tonight? Tonight that will be Lakeview Toastmasters. Alright, so you're in more than one? Um, yes, I am in Toastmasters at Lakeview Park as well as Windy City Professionals. Alright. All right. And what, what accreditation have you received thus far? See, I just completed my CC. I should be completing my CL. I'm going to try to go for Triple Crown, but we'll see. Alright. All right. October 20th is that the date? Okay, October 20th. So we got about two weeks. Now, one of the things that I see on your interest is about cooking, and so I was wondering if you could help us. Do you have any recipes that could use raisins? <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess you could do like a... Okay, there's one recipe I love. I love to make banana bread, but instead of making banana bread, I throw in chocolate chips to make it unhealthy, and do it in the muffins too. So I figured you can substitute raisins instead of chocolate chips. I think my children would go on strike. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you so much, and I have a certificate for you as well. Hola. Hola. Como estas? Bien, gracias. Ah, wunderbar. Oh, different language. <laughs> what club are you representing tonight, Dave? Daniel Wright Toastmasters and Gurney. Woohoo! Right. 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 20 years. All right, congratulations. And what level have you achieved so far? I'm kind of stuck at the old level of ATMG. Right. What can we do about that? I don't know. I guess pressure me to, to do my high performance leadership or something. Uh, there you go. That's a good idea. All right. Dave aprender, aprende español. He's learning Spanish. ¿Cuántos años estudia español? How, how many years have you studied Spanish? Estudio español 10 años. Oh, muy bien. 10 years. Uh -huh. um, have you traveled to any uh, countries where you could use your language? I've been to Mexico five times. Spent two weeks in each time there. Okay. I don't have a whole lot of time to do this because I have a job, so... <laughs> <laughs> Those jobs sure get in the way. All right, well, keep practicing. And we have a certificate for you as well. Congratulations, Dave. <laughs> Hi, Jesse. Hi. What club are you representing tonight? I'm representing Deer Brook Park Toastmaster Club. All right, and how long have you been in Toastmasters? About uh, well, over four years. Right, congratulations. And what level of achievement have you achieved thus far in Toastmasters? I work really hard, so I just achieved my DTM two months ago. And so now that you've completed your DTM, do you have more time to spend with choir? And uh, tell us a little bit about the choir interests that you have and the type of music that you sing. Oh, I love singing with a group. And I started singing in the choir since I was 10. So that's been uh, one of my passion. And this year, I joined um, choir in the north suburb. And we prepared for the holiday concert. So we only meet three months a year, but we sing every week uh, starting October 1st. So come to my concert, uh, Green Oak uh, Choir, uh, on December 14, 7.30, and Holy uh, across Lutheran Church on St. Mary Road in Libertyville. All right, I think that's a Friday if the first is a Saturday, so I hope everybody can make it. Thank you, Jesse. Congratulations. <laughs> Hi, Sherry. Hello. How are you? Excellent. Now that it's over. Right, now that it's over. <laughs> what club 
club are you representing tonight? Club 612 North Suburban Toastmasters. And how long have you been in Toastmasters? It's been six years. And what accreditation have you achieved thus far? My advanced communicator silver and advanced communi uh, leader bronze. All right. Congratulations. <laughs> Now, one of Sherry's hobbies is about jewelry making. You know, and I, I thought, you know, it's kind of really easy to do. You go and get some beads, it's on sale at Michael's, you get some little tools. I, I found it is much more difficult than what it actually is. So tell us a little bit about jewelry making and what type of jewelry you create, and hopefully get some inspiration and get better. <laughs> well, I learned how to make bracelets last year. They're, they're, they imitate the Chan Mu type bracelet, if you've ever seen those two pieces of leather and then you weave beads through the leather and it's really cool you can make two and four wraps and it's quite easy much easier than what you've probably gone through probably can my seven-year-old do it uh just okay. around there <laughs> but they're fun to make and they make great presents all right great thank you so much we have a certificate for you as well congratulations I would like to welcome our humorous speech contestants up to the stage, please. Come on up. job of lining up. All right. Hi, Barbara. Hello. What club are you representing tonight? 1856 Figures of Speech. All right. And how long have you been at Toastmasters? Three years. And what accreditation have you achieved thus far? My CC and my ALB. All right. Good work. <laughs> One of your interests said family dash road travel. So I wasn't sure if those were really supposed to go together. And do you have any other interesting snippets you have of family road travel that you could share with us? Yes. Every weekend from May through September, I meet my family in Wisconsin. We have a little place in Iowa, and we sell fireworks. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, just as family, we'll get in the car with no destination in mind on the off months that we're not selling fireworks. And we, uh, like, we've been known to go to carbon just for some mushrooms. <laughs> That's a drive. Yeah. All right. Um, we'll let me know the next time you get some mushrooms. All right. Thank you so much, Barbara. Thank you. Hi, Jerry. What club are you representing tonight? Uh, Deerbrook Park Toastmasters. All right. And how long have you been in Toastmasters? 24 years. You beat you. All right. And what accreditation have you achieved thus far? Uh, like Dave, I'm stuck in. Right. We'll work on getting you on HP all going. <laughs> all right, so you talked a little bit about the Gen OOs. What can, what can you tell me about Gen X and Gen Y? <laughs> they, they're very young in some cases, and they're, they're going to change the world in their own way and uh, hopefully make a better world for themselves because Gen OOs, haven't done such a great job so far. Oh, I don't know about that. All right, one of the things you had down also was wine tasting. Could we, is there an event that we could have at the Gen OO Olympics with wine tasting? Could you create that? I don't, I don't think that would work, but uh, wine tasting, like anything else, whether, whether you're into beer or you're into cigars or whatever, there's a, there's a, a, a variety, and the only way you find what you like and what goes well with the recipes and food you make, you got to taste it. And that's the fun part. That's what I was going to say. <laughs> All right, thank you so much, Jerry. <laughs> hey, Ruth. Hi, how are you? I'm good, how are you? Fine, thank you. It's a little awkward with the microphone. What club are you representing tonight? The Talk of the Glamping. Yay! 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 And how long have you been in Toastmasters? Two years now. And any accreditation that you've received though so um, far? Just working on my, I just finished my sis speech, so okay. I'm headed towards it. All right. All right. That's what, keep working on it.
All right, so one of the items that you have is music, and so I'd like to know a little bit about the type of music that you like to either listen to or create. Well, I spent 15 years playing the piano, so I did a lot of gospel and church and whatnot, but then last week I went to the Prince concert for two days. <laughs> <laughs> so I party all night. Like it was 1999? <laughs> all right, all right. Thank you so much, Ruth. Congratulations. Hi, Stan. Hi. You're in! <laughs> All right, I don't know what that means. What club are you representing tonight? Uh, Daniel Wright. And how long have you been, uh, how long been Toastmasters? Well, I, hate to, I, I started back in 68 when uh, uh, they had such a All right. And what accreditation have you achieved thus far? Well, I'm kind of stuck. I've, I've done uh, the CC manual five or six times. <laughs> <laughs> doesn't sound like it's stuck. All right. Um, so one of the things that's interesting is I'd like to hear a little bit about your commute. You work in Lincolnshire, but where do you live? Uh, up in Wisconsin. Okay, Genoa City. How far? Genoa City. Genoa City. And I, I live in Wisconsin for nine years. I should have had that right. Um, so how long is your commute each day? It's about an hour and 15 minutes. I, I have to shave by the time I get there because I think I crossed two <laughs> time zones. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and then you have to pass like Mars Cheese Castle. Are you on 94? No, no. Oh. 12. Oh, okay. Ooh. <laughs> All right, so every day when we're doing our commute, let's be a little bit better than what Stan has to go through every day. Well, the Village of Lincolnshire thanks you for making the commute every day. That's the town of which I work. We have a certificate for you, Stan. Thank you. Bonjour. Bonjour. Comment allez-vous? Très vous. Uh, bien, croissant, <laughs> um, un verre vin rouge, s'il vous plaît. Pourquoi pas? Okay, I just asked her for a glass of red wine because that's about as far as my French goes. But let me try this. Um, okay, uh, what club are you representing tonight? I, I represent the Francophone by the World Toastmasters. Yeah. Well, like you've been in Toastmasters? Wunderbar! Oh, one language. I've been in Toastmasters since 1997 when I joined a, as a charter member of a club in Doha, Qatar. Then I went on to be a Toastmaster in France, and now I'm here. All right, great. And what accreditation have you achieved so far? DTM. Yay. All right, congratulations. Yay. All right, let's see if I can get this right. Qual est le rue préféré que vous avez vécu? She said, where, what, where have I preferred living in all the places I've lived? Because I've lived in Egypt, and I've lived in Qatar, and I've lived in Pakistan, and I've lived in France, and I've lived in the States. And I like all of them for different reasons. So if you want to hear about that, um, it'll take more than a minute. <laughs> <laughs> but everywhere you go, you can find really good people. And I think that's what makes a place good. It's the people who live there. All right, thank you. Merci. No, you didn't list any languages, so I don't have to uh, test with that. All right. <laughs> All right. Francesca, what club are you representing tonight? Uh, Unity. All right. And how long have you been in Toastmasters? Uh, about a year. And what accreditation have you achieved so far, if any? Um, I'm up to my fifth speech. Yeah. Okay, congratulations. Keep working. <laughs> what you doing tomorrow? I am not going to the marathon. <laughs> <laughs> Me either. <laughs> uh, but you have listed that you like musicals and dancing and Gene Kelly. So but did oh, yeah. you consider maybe dancing the 26 miles oh. instead of walking? <laughs> so tell us a bit more about the dancing and the musicals. Well, I love those dancing shows, and I'm, Gene Kelly was my hero. So I've seen Sing in the Rain like a billion times. So. Yay. It's the awesome. Yay. Yeah, it's so handsome. What a good dancer. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much. And here's your certificate. Thank you. All right. All right, round of applause for It's the time that you really wanted to hear. Please help welcome to do the announcements for our contestant winners is Jane Sanjanez.
afternoon, everyone. How's everyone doing today? Good. 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 Yeah. All right. That's how we do it, do it in the Northeast. My cops. Absolutely. <laughs> All right. In the interest of time, I will hurry this up. So first off, can I have my team coming up here, please, to help present the award?
English. Thank you. I'll be honored to represent our division at the district. <laughs> Everyone, thank you so much again for coming and joining us today. We appreciate your attendance, appreciate you coming over here and supporting all of the contestants. Equally, we ask you to go to the conference and support them there as well. So thank you so much, everyone, for coming. Have a wonderful night and see you at the conference. All right.